Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Young Investors Podcast. We're at episode 24, and joining me, as always, is Brandon. How's it going, Brandon? Hey man, what's going on? Yeah, not a lot. We've got another exciting episode this week because we have another guest on. And this week we have Richard Coffin from the Plain Bagel YouTube channel. How's it going, Richard? Good, good. How are you guys? Yeah, I'm going well. Very well. Yeah, good. Yeah, going well. Yeah. Excited to talk. We've got a lot of interesting news topics that we'll probably fly through because we've got a ton of news stories to talk about. And then we'll <laughs> jump into the main section of this podcast. So if you're new around here and you don't know the structure that we usually take, with this podcast we're going to start off by going through very briefly we'll go through the indices we'll go through the u.s indices we'll go through the australian indices and we'll go through the canadian one as well We'll go through the toronto stock exchange just for this week oh nice (laughs) thank you thank you guys i appreciate that (laughs) can't say i've ever looked at it to be honest (laughs) it's it's pretty close to the s p 500 so it you know kind of sister economies more or less Mm. Anyway, but then we'll get into some news topics. We'll just fly through some sort of things that have been happening in the news for the week. Then we're going to get into the main part of this podcast, which is we're going to talk about Richard and his background in finance and, of course, his YouTube channel, The Plain Bagel. Uh, And then we're going to discuss a couple of industries that are sort of have similarities uh, between the Canadian system and the Australian system. And those two areas are telecommunications and the financial sector. And then lastly, I think we've got a couple of Q&A questions we can go through from the audience. Uh, And just a reminder, if you guys have any Q&A questions for next week's podcast, then make sure you leave them in the comment section below of the YouTube video, which will be on my channel this week. So yeah, yeah, should we jump into it? Do you want to go through the indices, Brandon? Yeah, for sure. So we've got over in America, Dow was up 2.24%, NASDAQ up 0.77%, S&P 500 up one17 um, And then in Australia, we've got the All Lords up 1.37%, ASX 200 up 1.5%, and then the TSX over in Canada up 1.54%. What does TSX stand for again? Toronto Stock Exchange. Toronto. Toronto. Yeah, so, so there's a Wall, Wall Street in uh, the States, and we have Bay Street in downtown Toronto. So Bay Street. And what's ours? Is ours George Street or something? I don't even know. I don't know. I probably how, should know that. Yeah, how funny is that? <laughs> I, I only know it because it's a lot of people have to go to Toronto to get finance jobs. So when you're in university oh. and they're, you know, they're trying to give you career advice, they pretty much say, like, go to Toronto. I'm one of the lucky yeah, right. few who got a job outside Toronto, but... Yeah, they, they tell you, you know, Bay Street's the place to be. But yeah, it's it's our it's our Canadian Canuck uh, Wall Street. Yeah, right. And apparently there's like, there's two ways to say Toronto. And there's a tourist way. And apparently the tourists call it Toronto. And then the, the, the locals just call it Toronto. Uh, yeah, sometimes it goes Toronto as well. But uh, oh, that's, right. <laughs> that's like oh, if wow. you're, you're really into the dialect. <laughs> All right, should we get into... So that's the indices... Yeah, nothing, nothing too crazy. America did pretty well. In fact, everywhere yeah. did, did decently in the last five trading days. Um, and with that said, let's get into some of the news stories. I got the, I've got the first news story. The most important, the most important news story of the week is that Elon Musk was on meme review. It actually happened after countless tweets, taunting tweets. <laughs> we actually saw Elon Musk on meme review. How exciting is that, gentlemen? Isn't that just the most exciting news story of the week? Oh, it's just great. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people out there who have no idea what you just said. <laughs> yeah, I'm, oh, I'm not God. one of them. I totally know what's up. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we know what's up. Go to PewDiePie's channel and then um, look at his most recent video and you'll see Elon Musk looking at memes with the guy from Rick and Morty, the guy that does the voice oh, for really? Rick and Morty. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what his name is. I can't remember. But they sat down at the end of the video and just like went through some memes and had a good laugh. So anyway, sorry, that's like totally a, a non-story in terms of the markets. But um, <laughs> all right, what, what have we got next? Uh, all right, well, I can take this one. So uh, kind of interesting crossover between the stock markets and I guess real life, but Nike shares... Uh, kind of came down a bit on Wednesday after Zion Williamson, a uh, Duke player who's kind of quickly rising in popularity in the basketball scene, in mid-game, his uh, Nike sneaker basically tore right in oh half. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> causing a knee injury for him. Oh, what? Uh, leading <laughs> led to a $1.1 billion drop in the market capitalization for Nike. 
Oh my gosh, that's ridiculous. And it's a uh, if you if you see the video of it, it's actually pretty. I don't know. It's it's pretty impressive. Like the fact that he was able to destroy the shoe the way he did. Like his his the whole bottom of his foot comes through the shoe. Oh, oh wow. my god, it's insane. That's cr- and it, and and he got injured from it. Yeah, knee injury. I I couldn't oh tell gosh. you how serious it is, but but he yeah. looked in pretty rough shape. It's not a. Not a good look when your no. Nike's when no, your Nike's not. split in half and you get a knee injury from it. Yeah, that's not a good look. But how crazy is that that it caused the the stock to drop one point one billion dollars? Oh, what! It's yeah, huge drop in market cap. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty interesting that something like that can have such an impact because I mean it's bound to happen. I mean they're not they're not a flawless company. There's going to be things happen like that, but there's just so many yeah. eyeballs on the basketball. Uh, what is this college basketball i think it is um yeah, yeah. in the us and yeah that's uh, yeah it's, it's amazing 1.1 billion dollars in market cap just wiped off yeah just like that and then all right what's up next in news uh so one other thing we've got here is that so warren buffett uh and his company berkshire hathaway will be releasing their annual letter to the shareholders uh on saturday uh so that'll be tomorrow i guess um, and that's just an interesting one because it usually has quite an influence on the market. And it's always interesting to see what Warren Buffett says in the letter. Uh, I, I always enjoy reading his letters. I think I've read all of them actually since 1964 right. um, because they're just, they're always, there's always little gems of just really good information about <laughs> what you should be focusing on as an investor. And I find it really interesting to sort of read through those. What, what do you think about that, Richard? Yeah, I mean, it, like you said, there's always kind of a uh, Warren Buffett has such a knack for just, you know, coming up with sayings on the spot, and so mm, many yeah. of his uh, of his famous lines have come from his letters to shareholders. So, uh, you know, it's it's <laughs> it's funny. Like a lot of people, like this is an exciting time of year to see this letter uh, to shareholders coming out because you know they live to experience that firsthand, I suppose. So, mm. uh, yeah, I, I definitely haven't read all of them, but, but I've read a few of the, the, uh, the old ones where, uh, you know, he said some of his important lines. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, he has such a huge fan base. So, you know, whatever yeah. he says and, and such an incredible following that he, like you said, he can move the markets based on what he says. It's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, and Hamish, didn't you say that there was a, a summarized book or a book that breaks down all of his letters into different sections, like sections on management teams, and and they take snippets from all the different letters? Is that yeah? Or was that yeah. something different? What no, was that yeah. called? Do you yeah, remember? I believe it's called uh, the Essays of Warren Buffett. Uh, Essays and of Warren esen- Buffett. And essentially, this author has just gone through all of the letters to the shareholders. And he's categorized them in, so if you just read the letter to the shareholders, obviously they're in the order of years, but he's categorized them in orders of sort of sections of investing. So he's got parts on corporate governance, he's got parts on valuation, uh, and it's a really good way to read the letters to the shareholders because it's sort of, it's, it's a little bit easier to read it by topic because that's how a normal book reads, not, you know, mm. year to year um, and just sort of bits and pieces here and there. So it's actually a really good book to to read if um, you're interested in getting into seeing what Warren Buffett is all about. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to pick that one up because you really enjoyed it, didn't you? I did. I think it's probably my favorite investing book that I've read so far. Wow. Yeah, I keep so. I keep meaning to order it, but I always forget. I'm going to go order it. I'll make <laughs> a note right now. Anyway, so so that's the Warren Buffett thing. Yeah, look out for the annual letter to, to the shareholders. Always got great information in there. Um, and then what do we got next in news? Yeah, so, I mean, sort of following on from Warren Buffett, one of the companies that Warren Buffett owns, or he partly owns, uh, Kraft Heinz, uh, had their share price go down over 25% last night. So did you want to sort of tell us what happened there, Richard? Yeah, uh, so the biggest thing is that they wrote down their brands by $15.4 billion. Um, Wow. On top of that, they slashed their dividend by over a third. And, you know, based on what we've seen in the past, any time a company slashes a dividend, their their stock usually plummets, especially when there's no warning of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's it's you know it's funny because uh, and I'm the one who kind of tossed this in the mix because <laughs> Kraft Heinz has kind of a special place in Canada because well in a in a weird way it was kind of at the yeah. d- uh, middle of the uh, U.S. Canadian trade dispute for some time 
Uh, mm. There's basically a lot of Canadians were trying to boycott Kraft Heinz uh, ketchup. Oh, oh, uh, right. I don't know how. So I'm guess you guys have Heinz ketchup in Australia. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. So in Canada, uh, Heinz ketchup was always like the the standard staple, and then <laughs> when there right. was a trade dispute, everyone started buying French's ketchup because it was made in Canada. Oh, okay. So there was basically <laughs> this this national nationwide boycott on on Heinz ketchup. It's a, <laughs> it's a strange time. <laughs> yeah, oh, poor Heinz. <laughs> yeah, Heinz is probably the biggest brand for ketchup it is in Australia as well. I think I think it's a massive brand oh, okay. globally. Mm. Yeah, no, that, yeah. that's that's quite funny. Uh, that company that people started buying, I'm sure they did quite well for a couple of quarters. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Imagine that other company. That yeah, they'd be like, oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> Boy, yeah, right God, Heinz. Perfect time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's crazy. So shares shares down over twenty five percent. Dividend slashed by over a third, and and that was just out of nowhere. Like they didn't really, an investor couldn't anticipate that coming. You don't think? Well, so I read as part of the headline as well that uh, they're actually being investigated by the federal security regulator. Oh, which, okay. It, on top of the other things, might actually be the most important reason as to yeah. why their stocks down. Um, yeah, probably. My <laughs> guess is that that probably wasn't disclosed before this. Uh, before uh, yeah, this other information was disclosed. So, I mean, I don't know. It's it's not a company I've actually looked at myself, but yeah, uh, yeah, maybe yeah scary that. stuff. That's that's what happens in the market sometimes. You just get kind of hit out of right field from a uh, with just these I don't know these yeah, these, of, yeah. of a of a news of a press release. Yeah, yeah. and I think that um, some companies. I was reading about this recently. I didn't really realize that this happened too much. Is that they try and if they know that bad things are going to happen, they just try and take out like all the trash at once. So it's just like maybe if they knew that they were going to have to release, they're being investigated by you know the. Um, federal securities regulators then they're like ah oh, why not this is a chance let's write down our brown brands at the same time let's cut our dividend because it yeah. kind of all just gets kind of mashed together and like yeah. there's already you never know maybe they just would have released that they're being investigated by the federal securities regulators and it might have just dropped 25 percent just on that so take out yeah. the trash at once and then you only have to make one big bad announcement and then instead of making three i suppose <laughs> Yeah, that's that's interesting. I've I've never heard that theory, but it, it it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I kind of see that in my 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 day job is, you know, the same thing. Where when when someone drops bad news, it's like it's all at once. It's you know, yeah, the investigation as well as the fine that they're facing and the dividend cutting. Like it's it's usually yeah, yeah it's it's <laughs> it's just a heap of trash tossing you all at once. I remember I was listening, re-listening through the Intelligent Investor audiobook um, over the last couple of weeks, and I think oh, that nice. there, there was there, yeah, there was one instance that Graham talks about. There was one particularly bad market year that was just bad for all sorts of reasons outside of most companies' control. I can't remember what year he was talking about, but he was talking about how a lot of companies used that year to do like, okay, let's write down everything, you know, all all of the, the crap that might happen or that we can, you know, get out of the system, any of the stuff we need to clean up in our accounting, you know, let's just do that and get it all out there in this year, which is already going to be a bad year for everybody. So we probably won't get the spotlight on us too much. Although the problem here is that I guess that it's not, not too bad of a time for most investors and, um, and uh, yeah, Kraft Heinz came out and gave us three at once. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So speaking of stocks plummeting, stamps.com stock plummeted 58% in one day yesterday, which is, oh. I don't know if I've ever seen a stock fall that far. Maybe I have, but that's one of the highest, the biggest drops yeah. I've ever seen in a stock. And the reason for it was that, they essentially discontinued their partnership uh, with the U.S. Postal Service, and they they had a partnership oh, with right. the U.S. Postal Service, which gave them discounted rates for their well, basically Stamps.com is a postal service, so uh, it gave them discounted rates for shipping parcels and that sort of thing, um, and they discontinued their partnership. And the reason that they're doing that is kind of interesting, really, because they're just betting, they're just hoping that Amazon is going to launch a postal service so that they can make a deal with Amazon at some time in the future. So huh. it, it, it's kind of odd because Amazon doesn't have a postal service, but they're just betting on the fact that they're going to release one and they don't want to be tied up in a partnership with USPS so that they can make a, a deal with Amazon. 
Um, right. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. What do yeah. you guys think about that? Yeah, that's really interesting. So discontinue their partnership with USPS. They're betting in the future that Amazon's going to come through. I mean, it's a risk, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's quite the gamble. Yeah, really. Yeah. I don't know it's... if I'd quite if I'd want to take that gamble, but um, yeah. Well, they're obviously um, copping it right now. If they're down fifty eight percent in one day, that's a that's yeah. That, I reckon that's probably the biggest one day loss I've ever seen in my experience of stock market investing. I don't know. Have you guys yeah. seen anything bigger than fifty eight percent drop in one day? Not that I can think of off the top of my nah, head. That's nah, I can't massive. think of anything. It's yeah. pretty huge. <laughs> Cop that I'm, over half. Stamps.com, that's the uh that's the online service, is it? It is, yeah, it's an online I, service. I feel like I've definitely heard uh one of the podcasts I listen to sponsored by Stamps.com. Oh, okay. I've okay. heard of it, but I don't know what they do. I, I yeah. think my understanding is it's like a subscription service for mailing stuff. I, oh, I right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, they're down 70% from their all-time high. And the interesting thing was um, when they were around their all-time high, I actually made a video on them uh, because their numbers looked really good. And I said mm. that oh, right. on the surface, their numbers look great. But if you dig a little bit deeper, a lot of their performance in the past is dependent on this deal with the USPS. So for me, I said, I'm not mm. interested until I see what happens with that deal because we knew that that deal was going to be uh, renegotiated within the next year. Um, and it, it's interesting that, that that's happened because I'm getting comments on that video now. People saying like, yeah. good, good call. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's you always kind of got to look out for those you know, huge risks, like, and that, that is mm. a big risk, you know, when you have one partner that kind of brings in probably, I would guess most of your business. Most, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, right. there was a, a, to go on a tangent here, there was a, a company called Amia that ran Air Canada's reward system for them. So Air Canada being like our, one of our big uh, air carriers. Yep. And they had, they kind of spun off this business uh, and this business took care of their rewards and this business had one customer which was air canada and then uh air canada basically cut their deal with amia uh oh and then once the stock kind of plummeted uh they rebought them back into the business oh <laughs> pretty so they just oopsie uh, yeah i don't i don't know how uh how legitimate of a of a transaction that is but it, it seemed pretty yeah. uh, Fishy to, to and, and the CEO <laughs> sold all his stock right before and bought it all back right and after. bought it all yeah, back. Wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah, we just need a week where we're not partnered because I need to do a bit of buying and selling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> just need to lock in some profits here. Yeah. Don't worry, everything will be fine. <laughs> Uh, so that's stamps.com. Yeah, I, I haven't looked into stamps.com before. Um, and we've got one more news story. Um, this one, I'm pretty sure, is from you, Richard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I'm tossing in more Canadian <laughs> stuff for you guys. I, I hope you yeah. Australian fans like Canada. But uh, I love Canada. So <laughs> there's, this, there's this big Canadian company called SNC Lavalin. Um, it's a construction and engineering company. They, they have operations all around the world. Uh, they actually do a lot of work in Saudi Arabia from, from what I've seen. So, you okay. know, not strictly, uh, domestic operations yep. and, uh, they're hitting the news. Well, they've been in the news a lot lately, but just today, actually, they slashed their dividend by 65% and reported a $1.6 billion quarterly loss. So Ooh. Ooh. yeah. And that, I believe that's down from a three figure, uh, sorry, not three figure, uh, like hundreds of billions of dollars of profit from a year earlier. Oh. Um, now it's Yikes. it's not directly tied to this but at the same time that this is happening uh there's kind of this big scandal in canada right now about snc lavalin with our prime mm. minister um ah oh, right so one of these political crossovers <laughs> yeah yeah one of the yeah exactly it's uh from my understanding of it is basically that a former attorney general uh jody wilson raybold basically was pressure or the story goes anyway that she was pressured yeah, yeah, by yeah. the prime minister uh to settle a uh dispute with snc on bribery and fraud charges uh, right and then okay. when she refused to do that uh she shortly thereafter stepped down from her role and some people are saying that that seems a bit fishy uh... and maybe the prime minister you know 
told her to, Gave her to the take flick. a hike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. See you later. You don't yeah, want to so do it's, what it's, I want you to do? Get yeah, out. So it's yeah, that's pretty some, scary. Some dirty business. for, Or at least it looks that way. Yeah, Alle- yeah allegedly. But it, does, allegedly. it doesn't All look allegedly, great, does it? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look great though. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, and there and the word the trouble is that uh, the uh, Wilson Raybould is is not really saying anything on on the whole matter, so she's kind of oh. tight lipped about the whole thing. Yeah, uh. just kind of step back and see what see what comes of it, and don't get involved too much. Yeah, I think I think there might be a legal reason why she's doing that, like because right. of her position. Yeah. But it's regardless, it's it something stinks. <laughs> Mm, yeah <laughs> was that me no uh, uh, i don't think so it's it's it's, it's coming no, from here it's, it's coming it's, from here it's in the store. <laughs> <laughs> all right so so that wraps up uh the news stories for the week we actually had some really good ones but uh yeah if there's one takeaway make sure you go over to pewdiepie's channel and watch that meme review all right <laughs> so in pewdiepie middle section of the podcast um Really, we just wanted to talk really just uh, to Richard and uh, talk about the plain bagel and uh, and his background and, and talk about, yeah, some of the similarities and differences that we see in um, Canada and Australia, especially when it comes to things like telecommunications and, and the financial industry as well. So I guess starting off this segment, um, obviously a lot of the viewers won't know kind of what you do or, or, or who you are. So... Kind of, I was wondering if you could give us a bit of a background of like who you are and you know where you're from and and especially kind of your background in finance as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am currently in Ottawa, which is uh, capital city of Canada. Uh, I'm from nearby. There's a city called Belleville. It's kind of right between Ottawa and Toronto. Uh, so right. it's it's a small city, but it's between two bigger cities, so it's it gets enough traffic. Um. And yeah, it's, uh, I went to school here in Ottawa. I went to university for finance. Uh, when I graduated, I started working in the area, first at a company called MD Financial Management, where I kind of had a more operational role. And then I eventually got hired as an investment analyst for a really tiny company. Uh, I'm the sixth employee there called uh, Watson de Premier Steel Investments. Oh, uh, cool. Kind of nice. named after the founders there. And I've been there since, and uh, it's a job I love doing. Um, you know, I'm surrounded by people way smarter than I am, and I learn a lot from them. Uh, and it's once I kind of did my uh, university program, I, I really only fell in love with investments after the fact. Once I, you know, went through all the academic stuff, uh, and I started to see the real life applications of, of investing. That's when I really kind of fell in love and, you know, started to do uh things like this where where i would do finance as a hobby like i i would read about investing and i started making uh youtube videos on on the topic of investing um and yeah it's done pretty well for me yeah yeah i I found that too actually when i was studying finance um i found that i mean it was it was fine it was interesting to me because i'm interested in mathematics and finance but when i sort of pivoted to spending more of my personal time uh, looking at the actual applications of doing your own personal investments. That was where I sort of developed my love for uh, investing. Uh, just just for people who don't really know, what can you explain to us what the day-to-day role is of an investment analyst? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, on the broadest sense, an investment analyst is basically just someone who researches uh, companies and gives a buy, sell, or hold recommendation. Um, whenever you go to a bigger bank, that's really the limit of the role is, uh, it's someone who, who researches very in-depthly one or two companies because our company is a lot smaller. Uh, I'm more broad, like I cover a lot more companies, uh, a lot more sectors. Uh, I'm not really specialized, um, which, you know, I think is, it's really, uh, fun to actually be a general investment analyst because you get to see a bit of everything. Um, but yeah, the day to day is, is uh, pretty much in the morning, just kind of catching up on the happenings of uh, all the companies we hold. So we actually get research reports from uh, third parties. Um, all right. And these reports have like, you know, buy, sell, hold recommendations, but uh, we don't really pay attention to that. We really only focus on the. Um, on the news and the updates and, you know, why are they writing a report on this company now? Right. Uh, 
And then from there, it's uh, it's a combination. I do some operational stuff uh, because it's such a small company. You wear a lot of hats, but uh, a lot of my job is yeah. just spent kind of looking for ideas. Um, you know, uh, see checking our current portfolio and uh, seeing how the stocks have moved today and if uh, we should be selling anything or just holding on. Um, right. And scanning for new ideas in the markets. Yeah, nice. And so, so you do that, and then you also run your uh, YouTube channel, which is an awesome YouTube channel as well. When when Thank did you. you start that up? And um, like, what kind of? I suppose you you're already doing all this stuff for your work. What kind of made you want to go and then make a YouTube channel as well? Yeah. So, uh, and I I guess I didn't really mention in my background, but when I was working at MD Financial, I also started doing my uh, CFA. Um, my chartered financial analyst designation. Uh, right, so I took, okay. and I've since taken the three tests for that. Um, and while I was kind of studying for that, um, that's kind of, you know, that was my first glimpse into the world of investment analysis. Um, mm. And that's where I kind of started reading outside of work and things like that. Um, and while I was at work, I, I had a lot of friends kind of come up to me and ask for not necessarily advice about you know stock picks or anything but just you know asking for kind of an overview because Mm -hmm. i'm at that age group where a lot of people are finishing up school and starting their first jobs and for a lot of them it's it's that time where they have to start thinking about well you know should i start saving or you know do i invest Mm -hmm. what what does investing look like uh so i kind of started uh you know i would take people out for a beer and we would sit down for two hours and I would just kind of spew the world of investing upon them in like the two hour time frame. <laughs> so everything from yeah. like bonds to stocks to indices to mutual funds, like everything that I thought would be important to them to know. Um, yeah. Kind of with the idea that I didn't really want to guide them to one option or, or another. I kind of wanted to be yeah, very neutral course. in what I was doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, to say, well, this is an ETF and this is a mutual fund and this is even a robo advisor. And these are how individual stocks work. And you can kind of decide from that point based on yeah. how much effort you want to put in yourself, which one you want to do. Um, eventually I kind of saw that there was a demand for stuff like that, where, you know, even just covering very basic <laughs> information about, well, what is a stock and what is a bond and, you know, how do mutual funds work and, uh, things like that. So, uh, yeah. I just kind of started making the videos uh i thought maybe Mm. you know even if it helps a couple people that would be great uh and i've always kind of had a i've always enjoyed uh teaching i had a teaching job at university and i've always enjoyed finance and on top of that video editing uh i used to make videos just for fun so it was really kind of the awesome combination of three things that i like doing so yeah it it, it worked out pretty well just jumble them all together and then you get you get onto YouTube. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And when did yeah, you exactly. start? When did you start doing your YouTube stuff? Was that is this like a recent thing? Or you've been doing it for ages and ages? Or I've been doing it for about a year and a half. Uh, I started. Half. I had started a year prior, um, and then I got caught up with CFA studying, so I kind of put yeah. it on the back burner. Um, yeah. And then I actually had another friend uh, start doing YouTube videos, and he started seeing pretty good success. And I said, well, oh, good. Uh, maybe I should get back into it. <laughs> yeah. And now here you are. Yeah, yeah uh, now here I am. Yeah, I mean, uh, I touched on this last week as well, actually, how sort of under underdeveloped the finance space is on YouTube and how much demand there is for this sort of just even just general information stuff. Like a lot of your videos are just about like, what's the yield curve? I think that was your most popular video. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's people are just looking for this stuff, but it's just not out there. And the fact that all of these sort of finance YouTube channels have grown so quickly sort of has displayed how much demand there really is for this information, Um, especially around our age group between 20 and 30, where people start to figure out uh, and start to think about what they're going to do over the long term and how they're going to retire. Uh, and it, yeah, channels like yours are really, really helpful for people to sort of break it down because you, yours are, they're mostly um, animation. You're, you're starting to do some um, other types of videos now as well. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, they're, they're really engaging your videos. Um, and, Thank you. And, yeah, and I mean, I guess sort of, so what, so what kind of content do you create? It's mostly animations, but you're branching out to doing some more of yourself just on camera, right? Yeah, so I've always 
uh, it was always me in front of the camera to start. Um, right. And then my thinking was, well, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, I'm not the funniest guy. I And my videos are starting off a bit dry. You know, how can I kind of make them a little that much different that they might, you know, draw a bit more attention. So mm. I started simply just by making kind of uh, my own clip art, my own kind of pictures uh, of different avatars. And, and, you know, I made a little character for myself and I would kind of draw examples of this character in different situations. <laughs> and then I slowly just kind of picked up very incredibly basic animation, uh, things like, you know, transitioning, changing yeah. the size of an image, rotation, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the most yeah. basic kind of style of animation. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of got more and more comfortable with it. And eventually I, I released, uh, f well, my first video was fully animated, but that took me like three months to make. Uh, oh, right. yeah. Eventually I started releasing more regular fully animated videos. Um, so now, right now, I, I kind of, I do a bit of both now, I suppose. Um, I do some fully animated, uh, some where it's me just in front of the camera with kind of animations here and there. And now yeah, I started yeah. doing more uh, what I call my rant videos, <laughs> where it's me just kind of getting <laughs> mad in front of a camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, They're the that. best. Yeah. I feel and, it's uh, so therapeutic when that happens. Well, that's it. That's <laughs> it. That's It's more for me than for the audience, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I actually filmed one like a week ago and it was just that it was me in my house by myself just yelling at a camera for <laughs> two hours <laughs> oh yeah I, I love making those videos and they always seem to do quite well actually as well I think people people quite like when you're when you're clearly passionate about something and that you clearly have a distinct viewpoint and if you give you know facts to back up your viewpoint I think people quite like watching that yeah totally and and you know I think a lot of YouTube's appeal is the personality side of it. And, you know, yeah. a lot of my videos are pretty scripted. Um, but I like to have those uh, those other videos to show that personality side a bit more. Um, and I agree. Like, I think people like to see, you know, your personality come out. They like to see, yep. okay, like, what does this guy actually care about? What is this guy interested mm. in? Um, yeah. And that really comes out when you're when you're yelling about something. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. The the last question that I have about your YouTube channel here is where the hell does the name come from? Is there a story behind that? The plain bagel. Yeah, Tell us about that. It's uh it's not an exceptional story. Um uh, boo. <laughs> it's, it's never, but you know it's 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 cute and it's to the point. So uh it's basically from a university class. Um, there's a professor and he was talking about uh, financial prudence. So it wasn't actually related to investments. It was more so like, uh, you know, your spending and things like that. Um, right. You know, f uh, what would like they call budgeting it? and oh, personal yeah. finance and, and personal things like finance. that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he he just said the line, if you can't afford the cream cheese, uh, get the plain bagel. Oh, and right. That's and then like it like I didn't like think in the moment like oh that was brilliant like I didn't write it down or anything but then when I was eventually trying to think of a name for the finance channel I I really you know I didn't want to put like the money guru or or yeah, something yeah. like that yeah um and I thought of finance that and I, tips with Richard <laughs> yeah exactly um yeah. and so I I went with uh I picked that name and I I kind of asked a few friends I said like well what do you think and they're like, yeah, it's great. Like it kind of, you know, for some reason it, it feels like it's finance related, <laughs> yeah, even though yeah. like it's just a uh, pastry. Um, <laughs> but uh, I like but, yeah, it's, it's so it's, it's, you know, I feel like I'm kind of hyping it up to be this bigger story than it really is. And <laughs> honestly, this specific professor um, who I got it from, he would say the craziest things. So it's not like he had this one moment where he said this incredible thing. He says stuff like that all the time. Like he makes analogies yeah. like that. Um, you know, he said a few crazy things that I probably can't say on uh, this <laughs> podcast. But uh, that was one of the ones that stuck with me. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, Richard, before we get into looking at the telecommunications kind of sector and, uh, and also the financials as well, 
Um, I was wondering kind of if you could summarize your own personal way of looking at stocks or your kind of own personal strategy. What would you kind of say that is? What do you look for in a company? What are some like things you have to see and other things that maybe you really don't like to see? What What would you call your investment strategy? Yeah, so I think, you know, at, at, at my core, I'm a value investor in the most kind of uh, classical definition of it uh you know yeah. you mentioned the the intelligent investor i actually finished that uh just earlier last month actually oh uh, right yeah yeah and you know great book i i think you know stuff about the treasury bonds is a little dated now but yes. um, yeah the other lessons in there are are exceptional and mm. so i consider myself a value investor and uh to its core that just means looking for companies with strong management teams, uh, a good operational track record, um, mm. and, you know, good good growth uh, numbers. And, yep. you know, there's never... Uh, I find it's rare to find a company that ticks all the boxes. You know, it's, it's hard yeah, to find yeah. a company that is growing great, a uh, great management team, and it's cheap. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think it's kind of a balancing act between, well, what's most important to this company? Uh, are you okay paying up a bit up front for this uh, firm if they're growing really well? Or do you think that this company is at a turning point and uh, that the current discount is, is overdone on, on the firm? Yeah. I think that kind of that's kind of uh, similar to what Warren Buffett says, um, how he says, it's better to buy a really good company at a fair price than buy a fair company at like a bargain basement price. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And you know, there's there's certainly no, uh, you know, people talk about the markets being expensive, uh, but there's are certainly a lot of companies out there that are really cheap right now. Uh, the yeah. question is, you yeah. know, are they cheap for uh, because they're impaired, or are they cheap because there's just this negative sentiment about it? And yeah, I think exactly. that's such an important part about, uh, you know investment research is, is ascertaining what is impairment versus what is a short-term negative headwind mm. or, or some short-term pessimism. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. I mean, a lot of the cyclical stocks just got absolutely killed last year, primarily, well, partly because of the trade, but mm -hmm. primarily because of the expectations that we were going to go into a recession. And uh, right. obviously, cyclical stocks are going to get hurt dramatically. And I mean, obviously, we can't avoid a recession from here until infinity but it's interesting that if that doesn't happen mm -hmm. in the short term then that's something that uh, or, or even if it does happen often those cyclical businesses perform quite well when the economy is going well and we don't know how bad the a recession is going to be we don't know when it's going to come we don't know how long it's going to last and if you can i mean i always just think of it as the stock price is essentially the consensus it's what the mar it's what everyone thinks and if you're going to beat yeah. the market by being a stock picker then you have to go against the consensus you have to make yeah. a bet that they're, they're either wrong, completely wrong, or maybe if you're buying at a good company at a fair price, you're betting that they can outperform what the current expectations are. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think, you know, the term contrarian is a good one. Like it's it's about being willing to, to stick your neck out a little bit and, uh, you know, get rewarded for taking on that risk. Like the fundamental relationship has always been risk and reward. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you're willing to go against the, the pack on something you believe in, obviously, after you've done good research and uh, if you yep. determine that's a strong company, uh, then you should be rewarded for taking on the risk. So when I am looking at a company, uh, really, you know, some companies look good in some circumstances and some look good in other circumstances. Some might be growing really well, some might not be. And I don't really fret about uh, the specifics there, but... Uh, usually things like debt management are important to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like yeah. to see a company who hasn't uh, been over leveraging their firm over time. Like I, I look at things like their uh, debt to a bit debt ratio. And if that's rising over yep. time, that could be a negative thing. Um, and I also look for share dilution as well. I think that that's something that gets overlooked a lot. Um, mm, yes. But I think yeah. a company that's issuing, you know, companies shouldn't be able to make money out of thin air. So if they're issuing stocks and not seeing the growth to back it up, uh, then then that should be punished. Like, well, you know, it, <laughs> we should yeah, punish yeah, the companies, yeah. but it, the stock price might take a hit because of that eventually once it catches up to them. Um, so I always look for how a company is funding its growth. 
uh, you know, if a company is funding its own growth with its own cash flows, and that's exceptional. Yep. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's kind of the golden place to be. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, yeah. you know, outside of that, it's, it's really just, um, you know, there's no, I don't really offer any like specific rules. Like if a company has this, it's, it's a buy or it's a sell or whatever. Uh, right. But it's, it's kind of just, you know, it's, it's looking at the aggregate. What the combination of these factors are you okay accepting? Uh, what's kind of the minimum standard <clears throat> in aggregate for this whole company that you're willing to have? Mm. I, th- I think that's really good um, overall. It kind of just, that makes me think back to what we like to say all the time is that it really, everything comes back down to understanding the business. And I feel like that's pretty mm-hmm. much from what you're saying, that's probably overall what your number one thing is, is that you have to make sure that, you know, more, it's, it's not about does this tick a box, does that tick a box, you know, is it just the perfect company? It's more about can mm-hmm. I understand where this business is at and how they're growing and doing this sort of stuff. And if I can understand it, then I can just make an informed decision as to whether or not I believe, <clears throat> whether or not I believe that it's going to be a good company to make an investment in. Yeah, definitely. I, I have a coworker who just absolutely loves Warren Buffett and he can quote anything that Warren Buffett said since he was the age of yep. 50, I think. Um, and you know, he, he loves to quote, uh, you know, how Warren Buffett always says, like, you should understand, like you said, you should understand a company uh, if you're going to invest in it. Um, and this coworker of mine, he's totally okay to completely leave a, a stock untouched if he can't understand the business. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if it's like a, a tech company with uh, artificial intelligence that's, you know, rerouting uh, wires in, in Saudi Arabia <laughs> yeah. uh, to make a profit in, in India, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like he's okay to pass that up and, and yeah. uh, you know, because you, you said it best, like you need to understand the business. At the end of the day, you are buying the business. You're becoming the business owner. Um, yeah, and exactly. If, you know, if you were going to buy your own company, you wouldn't buy something you don't understand uh, just because it makes money. You would probably do the research and you would probably want to know, well, what am I putting my money into? Uh, and you shouldn't really treat stocks any differently. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many gems that Warren Buffett pulls out. I mean, that you should only invest as if the market's going to be closed for 10 years or as if you're buying the whole business and you can't quickly offload it. I think a lot of people get into the get into trouble when they use the market as a quick way to buy more shares and offload shares. I really mm-hmm. try to sort of, and I think it's a good approach to think of an investment as something you're not going to be able to take out. Even though you can, you should think of it as something that you don't want to touch for the long term and that way you won't make any investments that you don't feel 100% confident in or at least very confident in yeah definitely and and I think uh, to tie it back to something I read from the intelligent investor to also um, you know it's he touches on it in, in that book too where he says you know people get so caught up in the unrealized losses of their positions uh, you yeah. know, if their position's yeah. down by 20, 30, even, you know, 60%. But, you know, if you think of it from the perspective of a business owner, uh, or even from like a, uh, like, let's say you own a house and let's yeah. say in a given year, your house is now worth, uh, 50% less. Uh, yeah. your first instinct probably isn't, oh, I should sell this house in case <laughs> it, it loses <laughs> more value. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your first instinct is no, this house is worth, you know, whatever x amount and and i'm gonna hold on to it until the markets improve yeah Um, yeah and i'm still getting this amount of rent each month from it nothing in the underlying business of the house that you're renting out has changed um and over the long term it's likely that if population increases and if the area develop continues to develop that the house is going to appreciate yeah, yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. And, and and you know that's that's not to say that you shouldn't be uh, diligent and to watch out for for like I said capital impairment. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, you just you know it, you need to be careful. It, I think taking the perspective of a business owner uh, really helps uh, in terms of establishing good investment ed, uh, you know ethic almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that's a good wrap up of. Um, of kind of what your investing philosophy is. I guess it gives us good context now to talk about some a bit more maybe specific examples of investments and and different companies and their situations at the moment. So 
I thought that uh, it'd be interesting if we go through for you guys uh, talking about some of the telecommunications companies um, and really the telecommunications sector in both Australia and also Canada, because there are a couple of interesting points which uh, which, which Richard is going to talk about um, about the telecommunications sector in Canada. I guess I, I'll give you a bit of a context to our telecommunications sector over in Australia. So sure. at the moment, like Australian telcos, they're like down in the dumps, like nobody wants anything to do with them. Um, pretty much we've got like a few major players in telecommunications sector. There's essentially, there's Telstra, there's Optus, um, there's Vodafone, and then there's a smaller company called TPG. Uh, in terms of the sector itself, it's down like five, I think it's 5.8% for the last 12 months, but over the last five years, it's down by 34%. So it, it, yeah, it hasn't had a good ride over the last five years. And um, a lot of that reason is that in Australia, we're, we're coming into um, a, a system called the National Broadband Network. And essentially, the National Broadband Network is a fiber optic broadband network, but it's mm. owned by the government. So the the government is building this new fiber optic network and it's pretty much putting all of the telcos on the exact same position. They're they're all on the same start line now. So we've seen that Telstra used to have the copper network that we always used to use for our internet. And now they've gone from being a wholesaler for that system and now they're just a retailer. So all Mm. of these companies are now just a retailer for this government system. And the government system is just going so slow. Like, of course, it's the politics. And if you, like, Australian politics, it flips and it's changed. How many prime ministers have we had in, like, the last... I think we've had, like, six or seven prime ministers in... Yeah, in, like, the last ten years or something like that. Yeah. It's... It's ridiculous. So there's so much political flipping like between the stances on the national broadband network. So it's a, a very slowly progressing thing. Right. And um, yeah, and pretty much now all, all of the um, companies, their profit margins are now being squeezed being the retailer for this Australian government fiber optic network system. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And then you've got it all at the same time. These telecommunications companies are, are trying to keep up with the rest of the world and, and building 5G mobile infrastructure. So there's CapEx going towards that. And um, yeah, it's really just, it's just such a messy sector at the moment. And that's what's really pushed it down so much. What was the company that you were telling me about, Brandon, that was working with Huawei, were they? Or was that was that something completely Yeah, different? so this, the smaller player called uh, TPG, who's very much a smaller player, they were mm-hmm. trying to work, um, they, were, they, they announced, so they, they've been known for providing really cheap but really good internet services. Oh, okay. And then they wanted to, they wanted to get into the mobile space and, and, and build up a, a mobile network as well. So they were starting out with a 4G network and then they decided to use Huawei um, uh, infrastructure um, mm-hmm. so that because Huawei infrastructure was very easily upgraded to the 5G network because they knew they would have to do that quite quickly. Right. And um, essentially what happened is the Australian government last year said that Huawei equipment cannot be used Um, for 5G purposes. They put a ban on it because of security reasons, of course. So um, this small company, TPG, is is in a bit of of strife or they're in in trouble at the moment because they haven't... um, Well, they're not able to upgrade their system, so they're reconsidering their their mobile kind of... their mobile strategy, I guess. Yeah. So it's it's a pretty interesting sector, but it's just a mess. Like anyone that you ask, they'll just tell you that it's a mess at the moment. Um, how does that kind of compare to how the telecommunications sector sits in Canada? Yeah, it's it's, it's a little nicer here. Uh, <laughs> uh, the companies are, <laughs> are a goodness. bit more cushioned. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's funny though. You mentioned uh, Huawei and uh, 5G. Canada right now actually is uh, trying to decide whether to allow Huawei's equipment. Right, so right. it's kind of the same situation where my understanding is that Huawei kind of provides the cheapest 5G infrastructure. Yep. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, they're the cheap Chinese uh, kind of producer yeah. but obviously uh there's been this in the states recently i think they were the biggest influence on canada so far is that the states went out and, and straight up banned huawei equipment as well um and canada's right now deciding whether they want to do it or not um right and although they have been kind of playing more like initially people thought well the states banned it there's no way canada's gonna uh let it go through but now uh the european union i think 
uh, recently mm. gave them the okay so that they think they can manage the the security risk themselves uh, oh. enough that they can actually let Huawei equipment in the European Union. Right, okay. okay. So that's something that I guess is going to influence Canada now. Um, mm. But yeah, things are a lot uh, cushier for Canadian uh, <laughs> telco companies. It, it's kind of the same. Like we have a few big one so we have three main companies we have telus uh bell and rogers right and then uh we have what are called regional players and i'm not sure if you would have something similar but basically um they offer services in a very limited area uh so we have uh i think it's pronounced quebec core quebec core yeah uh and shaw and uh sorry and and shaw owns the other one which is called uh freedom um, right. So the thing in Canada with the telecommunications is that for the longest time, it's been a oligopoly. Um, these companies are essentially protected. It's it's really been these three big ones dominating the market, and it, it reflects in their mm. margins. I think they have a bit of margins of around 40%, uh, which is unheard right. of, I think, in the industry. That's, yeah. And uh, it all, and the worst part is that it reflects in the prices that we pay. Uh, you might have heard that in Canada we pay some of the highest, if not the highest, uh, cell. We have the highest cell phone bills in the world. Uh, That's I mean, crazy. <laughs> just my own cell phone. Like I'm paying, I want to say eighty dollars a month for six gigs of data. Um, wow. And, and yeah. that plan, I actually went to Quebec. To, to get that phone because it's it's our provinces are messed up in the sense that one province is cheaper than another one so oh that's with gosh. me that's with me doing uh cross province arbitrage to get a, <laughs> to get a <laughs> cheaper plan um yeah. but it's it's the funny thing is that it's it's all the reason why the industry is like that is because uh the government actually has a uh an act in, in place called the telecommunications act which basically uh eliminated foreign competition um which is right. funny because one of the big ones bell it used to be an american company it started as an american firm oh. um but essentially with such a big neighbor like the united states is obviously uh one of the most prominent economies in the world mm. uh this uh act was essentially passed to protect canadian uh canadian culture so the idea being that uh since a lot of telecommunication companies also had cable packages that they offered um that they were tied to kind of the culture of canada yep. you know with tv programs and stuff and they didn't want american mm. companies to overrun that industry because then it would essentially merge the canadian and the american cultures mm. together so oh, yeah. the idea was to protect canadian culture uh but now what it's done is it's limited foreign uh ownership of a telecommunication company to I want to say 20% voting shares um, although right. I read somewhere there's like an effective total of 46.7% so uh, okay. not quite majority like they can't own the majority yep. of the company um, yep. so it's led to this situation where you have these three companies that uh, can basically bully the market um, now yeah. the regional players I mentioned uh, the thing is that they've recently changed the rule so that these regional players, uh, which are the ones owned by Shaw, for example, which is an American company, uh, they they don't have that restriction anymore. So if you have, I think, less than ten percent of the market, uh, you don't have to worry about the foreign ownership rules. Um, and for the first time, we're actually starting to see a bit of competition in the uh, cell phone plans. Uh, there's a period right, of time okay. where Freedom Mobile came out and just said, uh, I think they were selling something ridiculous, like. Well, <laughs> ridiculous for Canadian, ridiculous for you, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yeah. ten gigs of data for I want to say like uh, fifty dollars a month or something like that. I don't know how that would add up in in Australia. I, th I feel like that's still not too bad. It's probably pretty. Com that's probably quite comparable to Australia. I would say that. Oh okay. yeah, so it's then, getting ten there, gig so. for fifty. And and yeah. it was it was like a one time thing. Uh, and it actually, you know, it was kind of unannounced and then Rogers came out and did the same thing very quickly, like, uh, kind of a reactive response. Um, mm. and so we're, we're kind of starting to see a bit of, uh, a bit more competition and some of the companies are now concerned because, uh, with the 5g equipment thing, uh, if that gets banned, then obviously they'll have to spend more money to upgrade that whole system and they're facing this competition. But I mean, compared to the rest of the world and what it sounds like 
what's happening in Australia, it's, uh, you know, they're still doing pretty well here. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's interesting that that piece of legislation, I didn't know about that, um, how it can sort of, it can have good intentions, but the consequence of that is that you're putting more regulation in the market and you're reducing the competition that can bring down prices for consumers. And it's just, it's interesting. I, I like always watching the dynamics of how these kind of legislations can impact the markets. And it, it's good to see that there's sort of some competition coming into the market and bringing down prices now. Yeah, and it, it makes sense. Like, uh, you know, Canada has a lot of, of legislation aimed at protecting its culture from America. You would think the Americans yeah. are really trying to, you know, push their their keeping up with the Kardashians and all that onto Canadians. <laughs> but um, it's like, uh, but when you look at the numbers, like it kind of makes sense why we're doing it. I mean, uh, Verizon, which is one of the American companies, the one company is four times the size of the entire Canadian telecommunications Whoa. industry. Whoa. So yeah, that's when you massive. take that into perspective, like that basically means this company could come in and just dominate the market and just wipe um, out the Canadian mm. companies. Yeah, and and that's why there's kind of been this push and shove with changing the legislation is because there's there's this fear that these uh, giant companies could come in and wipe out the market. It's the same reason mm. why we had a big argument with the states about cheese because apparently their cheese industry is a lot bigger than ours too. And uh, oh right, <laughs> and that was a big sticking point for donald trump actually but the big uh, cheese battle between yeah. canada and the u.s That's it was funny it, as. it's it's still ongoing a little bit but uh oh you know, wow we have a tra- we have a trade agreement signed now so i think the cheese oh, problems right. are settled but uh, yeah. i know some farmers were pretty riled up about that i find that really interesting just overall with this whole like this whole point that canada kind of tries to protect its own companies but at the same time, in in protecting the companies with you know with new rules, they what they're effectively doing is making a worse environment for the consumers. At the end of the day, because the the consumers have to pay more, so I find that interesting. It's like a, a an interesting kind of balancing act, I guess, for a government. How much do mm-hmm. we try and help Canada or Canadian business at the same time? obviously competition from a consumer's point of view is really good because it means that they're battle you know companies are battling it out on price and that's good for us we get the cheapest deals possible so it's a it's an interesting kind of political line where do you kind of draw that line yeah exactly and and you know i i don't have the answer for it i'm just kind of here yeah. to to, yeah. <laughs> to explain yeah well i don't think I don't think anyone has the answer to it. Yeah. It's just uh, you, you've got to try. I guess you've got to see. I guess you just got to try things and, and see what happens. Yeah, and and you know, like I said, there's a lot of uh, industries in Canada. Radio is another big one that's heavily protected from the states. And you know, at first you kind of wonder, well, you know, it doesn't really seem like f- uh, fair competition, and it, it is. Mm. It largely isn't. But at the same time, when you consider how massive. The United States economy is, and and really yeah. how small the Canadian economy is in in uh, comparison. It, you know, you can kind of understand where people are coming from in, in protecting some of the industries. One of the questions I had is that so, do you feel like the the pop the people of Canada, you know, Canadians mm-hmm. that you you live next to, do you feel like they they push they would rather see American companies come in and have to pay less for their mobile? Or do you feel like there is that sense of, of of pride in having the just the kind of Canadian companies to be able to choose from? Oh, I I, I would speculate that a lot of Canadians don't care. <laughs> they don't care enough. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I think you know a lot of Canadians. This is a pretty big sore point for them. Uh, you know, if right. you ever want to strike up a conversation with a Canadian, you can just start complaining <laughs> about your cell phone plan. Uh, so you know i don't think it's really a point of you know uh national pride or anything like that but i think it's you know and and you know i don't know if i'm in favor of one side or the other to be frank but i don't think the average canadian uh cares much about that i think they kind of see the the money being made by these big telecommunic these big canadian telecommunication companies and they say well you know what the heck why why am i paying 80 bucks yeah. a month for six gigs god damn <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly nah, i feel like i feel like that's fair <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so so you know I, it's nice to see a bit more competition and uh it's funny because the regional players are actually starting to dig into the bigger players quite a bit um and that should improve the pricing over time 
But at the same time, you have things like 5G, which could very well have the opposite effect, which could very much increase the cost for these companies and eventually uh, increase the cost of plans as well. So who's to say? I don't know. (laughs) It'll be interesting space to watch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, should we get? Should we leave? Maybe leave telecommunications there and get onto the uh, the financial sector in Australia sure. and Canada and have a bit of a chat about that. Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah. So all right. I guess I'll st- sort of start by giving an intro into sort of our system, and then we can throw it over to you, Richard, and we can compare sure. how the systems uh, operate and how, what are the differences and what are the similarities. Um, so mm. over in Australia. Um, the financial system is one of the biggest contributors to our GDP, um, and that is a contribute a contribution of 140 billion in the last year. Uh, and, and we essentially have these four major banks that dominate uh, the industry, uh, and they're all within they're all within the top 30 uh, safest world banks, which is sort of a, a, a ranking of the world's safest banks, of course. Um, yeah. And those four banks that we have are Commonwealth, uh, National Australia Bank, Westpac and ANZ um, and the combined four banks have domestic assets of uh, just under a trillion dollars and total assets of 1.4 trillion dollars so how does that sort of compare to the size of the Canadian banks yeah so uh, the Canadian banks uh, it's interesting because they only make up 7.1 percent of our GDP uh, but at the same time I believe they make up uh, close to a quarter if not a third of the uh, stock market of the TSS wow. right. Um, right so they obviously play a big role when it comes to investments um, and it's it's kind of the same structure we have uh, I believe the states uh, at least used to have I mean, obviously uh, prior to 2008 had a lot of regional banks um, the Canadian system has for the most part uh, always had five bigger banks that kind of dominated uh, they had Toronto Dominion, Bank of Nova Scotia, which is called Scotia Bank, uh, Bank of Montreal, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, and Royal Bank of Canada. The last two kind of, I feel like the last two were just trying to, you know, prove they're better than the other ones with the names. But, uh, <laughs> Imperial <laughs> Bank, Canadian. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> and that's the, I think that's the smallest one too. So I, I don't know if it's oh, that's funny. but. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're all likewise they're all within the top uh 33 safest world bank so canada has a pretty safe uh highly regulated banking industry so uh mm. it it actually fared decently well all things considered during 2008 um especially you know better than the states our, our southern neighbor uh so it looked pretty good up here um and mm. yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of the same idea. Like we have these dominant banks. There are some regional players here and there, things like uh, Canadian Western Bank. Uh, I think there's one called Van City. Um, right. Yep. But it's mostly these, like if you want to have an account in Ontario and be able to find an ATM in a different province, then you would need to go with one of these bigger banks. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the Australian and Canadian economies just in general are fairly similar. I mean, we both have our massive banking systems Mm -hmm. and Australia has a massive resource uh, sector and I think Canada has a massive oil sector. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So oil kind of competes with uh, finances in terms of uh, the biggest sector for the stock market. So same thing. It's it makes up, I think, a quarter of the uh, Canadian stock market. Um, It's been kind of rough lately and that might have gone down because of uh, with the oil prices kind of going down. But uh, prior to, to kind of the slump we've seen, it was one of the biggest sectors. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, uh, Brandon, did you want to sort of explain, because over so over in Australia, we've had recently in the banking system, there's been a lot of controversy because we've had oh, our huge. Banking Royal Commission, which is where sort of the government looks into the system and finds out what dodgy, dirty yeah. stuff that they're doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. And uh, <laughs> cleans it all out. They have. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and I mean, they some of the stuff that was uncovered was just absolutely shocking. Um, did wow. you want to sort of talk about some of that, Brandon? Yeah, I don't know a huge because to be honest with the with my investing, like I'm all about staying inside my circle of competence. And for me, banks are like whoa, so out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. like I don't really I don't really follow the the sector too much. But yeah, we've had this royal commission. I was just doing a little bit of digging. And essentially, it's it's just recently, like in the last week or so, been finally completely wrapped up. 
So hmm. it's it's all finished now in Australia. But some of the stuff they found was really quite interesting. So I had a look. They found instances of bribery, forged documents, repeated failure to verify customers' living expenses before lending the money, um, wow. mis-selling insurance to people who can't afford it. Um, they had uh, one of our a company called AMP. It's kind of like banking and home loans and insurance. Uh, admitted to lying to regulators repeatedly. Wow! <laughs> and the, yeah, the the CEO uh, hightailed it right out of there. And yeah. um, and this is maybe the craziest one is the Commonwealth Bank admitted that some of its financial planners had known uh, and did nothing about charging fees to clients who were dead. <laughs> what? That's crazy. Yeah. So there's a, a lot, a lot of uh, dodgy stuff. And pretty much you're seeing, like, for instance, the, the National Australia Bank CEO um, just recently resigned or got kicked out, whatever way you want to look at it. Um, but I think I found that it was, um, they they had a, a, a um, what do you call them? A shareholder Gen- meeting? General a, annual Yeah, general meeting. meeting. Right, yeah, yeah, general annual meeting. Yeah. And um, there was an, uh, they, they came to the topic of the CEO bonus for the year. <laughs> Yikes. And there was a, <laughs> Yeah, there was an 88% vote down for the CEO to get his bonus. Right, yeah, I think that makes sense. It it was quite spectacular watching some of the footage from the... uh, Because I'm a NAB shareholder, like I have a very small position in it. So um, I was watching some of it and it was just shareholder after shareholder coming up to the mic and just blasting the board. And it it, it was quite spectacular. All of them basically came up and said, there is not a chance that you're getting the bonuses that you've just presented to us tonight because of yeah. everything that's happened. I think I think it wasn't just Commonwealth. I think there was multiple banks that were Probably found multiple. to be charging people who were, who were deceased, which is, wow. yeah, I mean, that's a shocking headline and it's, it's pretty yeah. tragic that there's people out there that will do that um, for, oh, yeah. as their career. I mean, it, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really surprise me in part, but it, it's really, it's kind of sad. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think the it's it's a shame the finance industry and possibly rightfully so so based on stuff like this, but it has such a bad reputation and and it's it's tough because uh you know a lot of the biggest a lot of the biggest employers in the sector at least in Canada um, are the big players who you know there's so much bureaucracy and so many rules and so many uh you know where the top the main objective is just more sales and things like that. I yeah. think it's kind of a it's a breeding ground for things like these, uh, you know, where where people are charging clients who are dead because maybe they have a quota they need to to meet yeah. for their you know yeah. to, to get paid or or whatever it is. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's quite a shame. Yeah, and it brings up the question of like too big to fail. I mean, a lot of these governments really rely on these mm-hmm. banks for an indication of the economy, especially when it's such a big. Uh, proportion of the GDP in Australia and in Canada. I guess maybe in Canada it's only 7%, but uh, it's still a significant contributor. And Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a bank that fails, one of our big four banks or one of your big five banks fails and people can't withdraw money, that's going to be a massive disaster for either economy. So it's kind of... Of they're kind of in this situation where even if they made a massive error and they were committing fraud and the bank should go down in sort of free market yeah. free market economic sort of uh, standards, you really can't yeah. let it go down because of how devastating it would be just to everyday people. And and yeah, that that's exactly what happened in 2008, right? Like that's what we saw in the United States with the Great Recession. It was these companies, uh, you know, according to free economics and and you know all those you know proper capitalism like these companies should have gone under yeah. uh, but then mm-hmm. how many yeah. citizens would you damn by doing that you know these people yeah, exactly. who had any assets tied up with these companies and yeah you know i'm not saying it was a great decision i'm you know the auto industry would like to have a word with the american government but it it's you know it, it's it's a tough question and it it really goes to show like you know how uh, how the entire system is really tied to these big companies, and and like you said, too big to fail. It you know apparently they can fail, but can we afford it? Uh, I don't mm-hmm. know. Yeah, and I mean yeah. it's not just the fact that if one of the big four banks went down in Australia, that a quarter of the population would a sig- well a significant amount of people would lose a lot of their savings. It's the mm-hmm. aftermath, which is that no one in any of the who has money in any of the banks would ever trust 
the financial system again. I mean, course, I, yeah. I know if I had a significant amount of savings in one bank, even if it wasn't the bank that went down, I'd be pulling it out. <laughs> just sure, because yeah, exactly. you just don't know what's going to come around the corner. And if the fact that most people really don't know that much about finance and rightly so. I mean, I mean, most people don't really care about it. Yeah. And they just mm-hmm. sort of rely on professionals to do the right thing on their on the behalf of their savings and their retirement funds. And um, yeah, it, it is. It's a really interesting discussion point about what to do with situations like that. Yeah. yeah. They get too big for for their own good. Well, they get so big that we just have to we rely on them, really. So, yeah, I guess the, the power goes in those instances, the power goes to the bank. It's like if the Australian government's really relying on the bank, then the bank's like, oh, you know, we can just do whatever we want, really. So, yeah, well, obviously this is a pretty obvious one of where they've used used and abused that power and mm-hmm. and, um, and then it's really cost them, yeah. But even so, there was like so much political, um, like the, the, the government that ordered the Royal Commission in the end didn't want to do it, really. So they were like, no, let's really, I don't want to do this. Wow, <laughs> but they got that's just, crazy. They, they got so much pressure in the end that they did it. So, yeah, right. pretty crazy. I think that like, lastly, kind of almost just to sum up on this kind of topic, um, I'm going to use and abuse you, Richard, because <laughs> I, I, don't really, I don't really know too much about banks. So I thought, why not sure. get an investment analyst to kind of talk us through? I was wondering if, if you're from your experience, um, mm. what are kind of the, some of the things that you look at? If you are maybe looking at a bank from an, an analyst point of view, what are some of the kind of things that you might look at, um, you know, to see whether it's maybe in good health or something? And are there any red flags, any things that you definitely... Uh, want people to be aware of when they are looking at banks things that can get banks into trouble right uh well in in canada anyway the uh canadian bank stocks have a really good reputation for being kind of consistent uh with their growth and having a good dividend uh so they have a really good reputation for canadian investors um kind of the in terms of like more short-term concerns one of the biggest things and it's probably a global thing at this point is is debt levels in canada um, I think Canada has some of the highest kind of debt to income levels, uh, yeah. out of the developed <clears throat> nations anyway. Um, yeah. and that's just, because I believe the... Australia is, is quite similar actually. As is I'm not 100%, okay. as well. but I... Yeah. 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 And it, it's, it's, you know, just the result of low interest rates from 2008 have just kind of led people, uh, to be able to afford more houses and take on mortgages. And I think mortgages are the primary uh driver of that higher debt and i i want to say that per dollar of uh income canadians have or per dollar of savings canadians have 1.7 dollars of debt or something like that right Right. Uh, wow so in terms of like (laughs) short-term concerns that would probably be the biggest uh you know if you're looking at bank stocks and you see uh that a one of the companies is primarily in the mortgage space, they are probably suffering right now because there's some pessimism in that area. Uh, People are looking at those stocks and thinking, well, you know, how much more room is there to grow in the mortgage space when Canadians already, you know, have more debt than they can technically pay off right away. Um, So, you know, that's kind of a short-term headwind. That's not to say, you know, you can't buy a company that has, that does mortgages, but it's just, you know, one of the, why a stock something might be to look lower. out for yeah exactly yeah. and yeah. uh i mean like there's a lot of stuff to look at like in canada i keep mentioning the canadian market but i bet it's similar in australia um the banks all kind of have similar business models uh they don't really uh and uh, aside from maybe geography uh scotia bank mm-hmm. for example actually has a pretty big caribbean operation oh. um aside from maybe geography uh a lot of their business is similar. They have their, their investment arm. They have their, obviously their loan arm, which is kind of the core business of any bank is loans. You know, banks at their, at their core are just uh, a loan machine. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But, but kind of banks over time, the bigger ones have gone to diversify to investment banking, to financial planning, things like that. Um, Mm. But really it's, you know, I find banks compared to things like technology, especially technology is a good example uh, banks are a lot easier to compare sort of apples to apples. Um, so because yeah, of that, right. you can kind of narrow down a few points. Uh, you can kind of narrow it down to a few metrics. Um, yep. These won't give you the whole picture, but these are kind of things you can quickly look at to get a quick idea about 
the company, the bank's business. Yeah, uh, for sure. On the valuation side, you have things like uh, price to book value is a pretty common thing to look at. Um, yeah. Basically, you know, if it's below one, it's considered a discount. If it's above one, it's at a premium. Uh, yeah. But obviously that could be related to the business. If they have a higher risk, of let's say they have a derivative arm uh, that works with the derivative market, they might have a lower <laughs> PB ratio because it's a high risk business. Uh, right. And then PE is actually a pretty common metric in that area too for valuation. Um, yeah. it, I kind of mentioned the business mix quickly, but what I always like to do is look at how much of their revenue is coming from interest, like the interest side of the business. So percentage yeah. interest revenue, for example. Um, yeah. And you know, a lot of the big banks I find it's around 50%. Um, and then also their net interest margin would show you how much money they're making on their loans and you could compare that across the banks um mm. now I, I i checked before this podcast because i want to make sure uh the cet1 ratio uh that's actually used by australian banks too so this okay. is good because it's it's a yeah, fairly awesome. important one for canadian banks as well um, oh cool it's basically related to a international regulation i think it was uh i want to say it's called basil or basil four i think it's what's called okay um, yeah, but it came after the 2008 crisis and the long story short of this ratio is it's uh, how much capital out uh, they have put aside to take care of their uh, risky assets. Uh, so it could right. be somewhere between uh, 10 and 18 percent, for example, would be the range that you typically see banks operating in. Yeah. Um, and basically, the higher the ratio, it means the more risk the bank can take on in a future project. Uh, right, so okay. Let's say you had a bank at 10% and a bank at 15%. It would basically mean that the 15% bank uh, could possibly take, you know, do an acquisition that might uh, add some more risky assets, whereas a 10% yep. bank doesn't have as much room to do that. Um, oh, okay. So yeah. it's sort of like it's it's basically like how much not risk free but lower risk capital does this bank have at its uh, that makes sense that it can use essentially. Yeah. Um, and All then right. uh, one of the important ones as well, which is uh, the efficiency ratio. Uh, it's equal to <laughs> uh, for viewers who are calculating this while while we're talking. <laughs> it's happening <laughs> away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, oh, good, good. Uh, they're doing a full profile on TD Bank right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but if you take the non-interest expense, uh, so all expenses not related to interest rates, um, yeah. and you divide it by net income, that gives you your efficiency ratio. And the long story right. short is that the higher, the better. So a bank with a higher efficiency ratio is just that. They're more efficient. They have lower costs to reach their net income. Um, whereas a bank with a lower efficiency ratio probably has some room to grow. Um, so those are kind of right. like, I just thought of like some quick ones that, you know, they're pretty easy to access these numbers and yep. these don't tell me, you know, as with anything in investing, there's never, you know, it's not a quant model that I use. So yep. I never yeah. look at these and say, well, if they take all the boxes, it's a buy. It's about knowing these numbers and then also having the context of the numbers, knowing yeah. how the business um, is operating. Uh, the qualitative factors there and making a decision yep. based on that. Yeah. Understanding the business always comes exactly. back to it. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I think I'm glad I asked that. That was really good actually. Cause I, I don't really look too much at banks cause it's just not within my circle of competence. So I kind of just stay away, but yeah, I think that the viewers will get a lot of uh, value out of that. So thanks for going through that. Yeah, that no kind problem. of wraps up that kind of wraps up what we were talking about um, with the finance in industry or the finance sector and telecommunications sector. We've got one Q&A question for today and I'll ask this one to you, Hamish. So um, the question reads, I got this on one of my videos the other day, so I thought I'd chuck it in. How does Warren Buffett make money? Because he's always talking about how he never sells his stocks. So there may be, you know, a portion of his dividend, you know, a portion of his portfolio might be dividend stocks, but that doesn't seem to get him, you know, the hundreds of billions of cash that he's currently got at the moment. So where does he get that money from? Is he doing the dodgy? He's just printing it. He's got a printing machine. He's just churning away in his office. No. Um, so he, <laughs> he, he obviously in part... When, when you hit the billion dollar mark, they just give you a money, uh, money printer. <laughs> he's just, yeah, well done. Just like, you know, you it's like a... It's like it's a, it's like like a, a YouTube a, play button, but it's it's yeah, that's, yeah, 
That's what I was going to say. It's the, it's the YouTube play button equivalent. Well yeah, done, you exactly. get a money printing machine. Anyway, go on, Hamish. <laughs> no, um, yeah, so in part, he would receive some dividends from the stocks that he owns. So where he owns partial, he has partial ownership uh, in those businesses. Um, but a significant proportion of the Berkshire Hathaway business is subsidiaries. So he buys whole businesses and they operate uniquely within the business. So those businesses that he owns outright they generate profit. And those profits will go to Berkshire Hathaway, which is the holding company of those little subsidiaries. So he does make money from his stock portfolio, but he also does own, uh, well, Berkshire Hathaway that he is leading owns uh, whole businesses. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to have a look at um, what the uh, what the businesses are within Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, it just says list of assets, so I don't know. There was Geico a is a very big one that he talks about, which is an insurance company. Holy smokes, there's a lot of them, but these are also the ones that he just holds stock in as well. Mm. Oh, I wish I could Coca-Cola find a list. Coca-Cola anyway. for sure. Sorry? That man loves his Coca-Cola, so that's one of them. Coca-Cola, yeah, that's yeah, that's definitely one. Yeah. And he owns like 5% of Apple too. What crazy. Imagine owning 5% of Apple. Yes, please. <laughs> I think I think that was a recent buy, if I'm not mistaken. At yeah, least within, within the like, last year. Yeah, 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 it was. So anyway, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I guess a lot of people forget that Berkshire Hathaway, because we're always listening into like the 13F forms and that sort of stuff. What's Warren Buffett buying and that? But people forget that Berkshire Hathaway is itself a, <clears throat> is itself a business and it has uh, businesses underneath it which operate and generate, you know, cash flows for Berkshire Hathaway. Mm-hmm. So um, that kind of wraps up. I don't know. Do you have anything to contribute to, to that one, Richard? No, uh, the the money machine helps, but that's pretty much where most of it comes from. <laughs> yeah, and I guess the last Q and A question asked from uh, Brandon here in Canberra um, asks <laughs> where can where can the listeners find you online, Richard? Uh, they can find me at the YouTube channel, The Plain Bagel. I also have a Twitter account uh, with the same name and a Facebook page as well. Um, I want to say for Facebook and YouTube, the URL is just the plain bagel, all one word. And because some other bastard took the plain bagel, all one word on Twitter, uh, I have uh, the lower scores or the underscores for, uh, in oh. the words for that one. So, God damn. <laughs> that's like, that's a funny story. So my full name is, my full name is Brandon Vanderkolk. And the craziest thing, I went to make a new Gmail account and some some idiot out there has already taken Brandon Vanderkolk at gmail.com. I could wow. not believe it. Couldn't believe it. I'm not going to say what my actual email address is, but, <laughs> <laughs> Fair but yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't, could not believe that just my name was already an email address. Like you, yeah. you bastard. <laughs> it's, it's funny because the Twitter account, I actually messaged the guy with the Twitter account. I said, Hey man, like. You haven't tweeted in like three years. Can I have your account? <laughs> he never responded. But it's basically never an responded. account talking about bagels. So at least he, he, <laughs> he died doing what he loved, I guess. Uh, that's so funny. I imagine the conversations out of context. Oh, you run a, a channel called Plain Bagel. Um, what's, what's your favorite type of bagel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, but um, thanks very much, Richard. It was, it was awesome having you on today and, and getting your expertise because, um, yeah, your knowledge as an, uh, an investment analyst is is crazy. It's really good. Good to kind of have you on and talk about some of the similarities and differences between uh, Australia and, and Canada as well. So thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. And, uh, I, you know, I'm a fan of your guys' podcast, so I'll be, uh, I'll be keeping close watch. And thanks for, yeah. like I said, thanks for having me. This was... Uh, it's really interesting to kind of see how similar the Canadian and the Australian economies really are. Um, yeah. And, you know, just cool surprised. to hear about the Australian businesses that uh, obviously uh, the economies don't cross paths that often. So uh, very cool to get an insight into that. So thank you so much for having me, guys. That's all right. Thanks very much for coming no on. And thanks, Hamish. Thanks, Hamish, for uh, joining me once again and talking all things stocks. And uh, make sure, guys, if you do have any Q&A questions that you want us to feature in uh, next week's podcast, you leave them down um, in the comments section of the podcast, which this week is on Hamish's channel. Yep, because it's an even number. (laughs) But yeah, thanks, guys, for listening. Uh, We appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you guys in the next episode.